mass bending light. And what we have is that, again, uh, we have a um, situation where you have some of these experiments where they bend light, but they do it without mass. And those are all in quantum mechanics, in the world of the small. And in the world of the big, they have something else. They have mass doing it, because that's all that a mathematical physicist talks about, just mass out there. Everything in, in the universe, just mass and gravity. They never discovered uh, magnetism, you know, the magnetic fields of stars, of galaxies, they, of planets. They never discovered that all these uh, celestial objects, as we call them, um, have magnetic fields. So they do everything with mass. Everything is done with mass and gravity. Uh, dark matter, gravity. Uh, black hole, gravity. You know, mass and gravity, and so on. Everything is done with mass and gravity. Even the Big Bang, you know, it's that expansion, you know, which is being pushed or fueled by dark energy. What is that? Mass and gravity. What is uh, um, dark energy? It's the opposite of dark matter. One pulls, the other one pushes. So what is gravity, which is dark matter, and uh, dark energy is what opposes it. It's the anti-gravity that's pushing everything away from concentration. So it's, it's all done with gravity. And so no one has ever in mathematical physics discovered uh, uh, magnetism. You know, they, they don't think magnetism plays any role out there. So what can I tell you? Okay, uh, that's a big omission that they have there. Okay, so here we have it. Uh, we're going to start with the massless stuff. And we'll, we'll start here with the needle experiment. Okay, and uh, fellow says the following says the needle experiment is an insignificant uh, is as insignificant as the double slit experiment both are very easy to explain okay great light is not a wave and never was and that's how he starts his presentation he said he gives me a link and i go see the link see what it's all about but before that i need to clarify what he's talking about what is this needle experiment okay so let's start there we have uh thomas young 1802 and 1803, he did some experiments in his uh, dark basement, okay? And he found out uh, what is known today as the double slit experiment. We have two slits, he shines monochromatic light through it, through these slits, and he produced fringes on the wall. And that was kind of strange because you would think that if light goes through two slits, you would get two slits on the wall. That's not what he got, he got fringes. And there you see the double slit experiment with slits, and then, it turns out he did it also with a hair, and he acknowledged Newton. He said that Newton did that. He pulled a hair out of his head, I guess, and did this uh, experiment where he shone some light, allowed some light to pass through a little slit or, or some enter the room, a dark room, and he found uh, that the hair also produced fringes, okay? And it's very important to distinguish between the one on the left, the slit, the double slit there, and the one on the right, the hair. Okay, very important. And we're going to see why now in a minute. Okay, so uh, here is uh, Bill's needle experiment. Okay, and you'll see why uh, or how we explain it in, um, in rational science. Okay, we have a uh, needle, and we're saying that every atom of the flashlight or the, the laser pointer, whatever you're going to use there, um, every atom there, okay, is connected already to the needle, especially to the atoms at the sides, uh, on the sides of the needle that make up the sides, the edges of the needle. And every atom there is also connected to every atom on the screen, on, on the back wall, okay? So what happens is you have interference patterns, uh, and you can see there the pattern that it shows, okay? There are all these are intertwined there, okay? So what you have is, um, differences in, um, in uh, the uh, length of the links of the ropes that make up the mediator of light. Okay, that's what you have. And you can see it on the far right there in the hair experiment. You can see that all these are offset. And because of that, you have either uh, constructive interference where you see the bright bands and uh, destructive interference in between, in between the bands. Okay, so there it is. That's how simple it is with the rope model. Okay, no 
major problem there. Okay, hopefully uh, everybody understands. Everyone who's been doing uh, wave, we're replacing the wave with the rope. We're saying uh, light is a rope, okay, or it's mediated by a rope. What you have is a situation if you, you can simulate it with your hand, okay. You get your hands together, and as soon as you move sideways, okay, you can see they're offset, okay. See what happens to my hands? And that's what's happening. One rope is now one link or a quarter of a link or whatever amount behind the other one. They're not, you know, when they're together, you have constructive interference, and here you have destructive, and so on down the line. And so that's why you get the fringes. And that's been, you know, I didn't come up with this. Uh, this came up from the wave nature of light. They already had discovered that, okay? And uh, all we were doing is replacing the wave, which is a mathematical concept, with the rope. And with a rope, you can explain it. A rope is a thing. It's a thing that, you know, now is torquing there. And it's just either uh, uh, constructive meeting the uh, another rope right there at that same point, or they're offset by half a link or whatever. And that's what's happening. Very simple. Okay. What's the problem with particles, which is what this fellow is going to propose? Well, here it is. This is the problem. Okay. Here you see it. Okay, and this is something that, uh, by the way, uh, let me show this first, okay. Here we have good old Einstein and Niels Bohr, and in 1927 at the Solvay Conference, they had th this, this discussion. This was right there, this was what the fight was all about between them. And the issue was the slit experiment. And what was the problem? The problem was that uh, they were simulating it with particles, okay. And they said, well, what happens when, when you shoot a particle, you know, when, when you point the laser pointer at the slits, right? It would move the whole partition sideways. And so you would, have, you would not know, you know, the exact position of, you know, of the, of the beam because of the photon, really, because it hit, supposedly it hit the uh, partition, you know, the one that contained the uh, slits, and it would move it already. There was some amount of motion, a very tiny imperceptible motion, but, but that's what uh, Bohr was saying. You cannot determine both the position and the motion of the particle. This was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And so Einstein tried to get around that by saying, oh, if we shoot, you know, the, we do the, the uh, uh, slit experiment with a laser pointer or, or whatever, with a light, etc., and Niels Bohr, you know, just trumped him and said, no, you can't because the photon will hit the partition and move it. And now you don't know the position and the exact motion of the uh, photon that's going to go to the uh, screen. That was the whole issue. That was the, what the fight was about. So here we see it. Let me show you this again now. Here we see it. You see uh, this is simulated by someone else. I just stole it from them just to show you, you know, what, what we've got here. What you see there is a light source, and it shoots a photon. It's also been done with electrons. And they're shooting it against the, uh, the slit, the outside. Of, it's banging against the frame, which is called, uh, I looked it up, it's called a jam. Uh, the jam is the two lines, uh, vertical lines that form the screen, uh, the uh, frame of the slits. Okay, so they got these jams. Okay, so they have this, these lines there. It hits the edge of the jam, right? And then the particle goes there and interferes with the one from the other side. That's how they try to explain it with particles. Uh, the trick here is, or the, <laughs> the problem with it really is that uh, the particle has to be at two places at once because the particle is only one particle is shot out, but it's at two places at once. At the two... Um, uh, jams, right, the two sides of the uh, slits, and then they interfere when they hit the screen. That's how they try to explain it. Some people try to explain it this way, okay, I, they have other explanations as well. But what, what they have is they hit, they have to, the ball, the photon has to hit the jam, has to hit the frame or the sill or whatever, okay, it's got to hit there. So what happens? Uh, this is what happens, why we need the needle, because we get rid of the slits, okay? And here it is, you can see what's happening there now. Okay, you're gonna see in a second here. Instead of hitting the, we get rid of the uh, slit, 
we just leave something in the center. We're going to call it the needle. There it is. Oh, we only have a needle there. Okay, there's the needle. Now what's it going to hit against? Okay, how's it, how, how come it's going to come inwards if it has no jam, no frame to hit against and bounce inwards? See, now the photon just goes straight ahead. And now we, we can't get that photon to turn the corner. That's the problem. Okay, so this is the issue. Okay, and um, so here you see it. Okay, this fellow says, light particles explain rectilinear propagation and reflection. And no, it doesn't, because uh, the sun actually, you know, shoots particle in every direction uh, from every uh, atom in the sun is, uh, and this is according to quantum, right, shoots uh, photons. It creates these uh, light particles, particles of light, right, and shoots them in every direction, but the sun is, is spinning, and so is every atom within the sun. So as soon as it shoots one photon, the next one will not go in the same direction, not to mention the whole series of them. They'll, they'll curve around in space. And here, let me show you a little bit of what that might look like. You know, you got the sun, it's just like a sprinkler. It shoots photons in every direction if you're going to do this, if you're going to simulate this with particles. Okay, that's what's the nonsense is of doing it with particles. Okay, so uh, all I can tell you is, no, uh, particles do not travel in a straight line. It's impossible in, the, in our universe. So uh, this fellow is already... Uh, Screwed up on the first one. He said, uh, you know, particles travel in a straight line. Absolutely not. They cannot possibly travel in a straight line because everything in the universe is in motion. And especially, you know, the Earth. The Earth not only spins, but goes around the sun. So you can imagine uh, if, if we do the, if we simulate this with particles, you just shoot a beam, right? Let's assume that it's made out of all these particles, right? The beam. And, but the Earth is moving. And it's spinning, and uh, if it comes from the sun, not to mention every atom there is producing light, you know, light photons, particles of light. And they're coming towards you, but the sun is spinning and the atom is spinning. You know, you can't get a straight line no matter how you do it. So, no, you can't simulate light with particles. It's impossible. Okay, and we're going to get do a little more today with this. You can see where we're going with all this. Okay, uh, so here we have, uh, Fowler says, continues, he says, the more you get near the spot where the incident rays reflected angle becomes zero, the reflected rays are now directed towards the screen. So if we do it with a needle, right, like uh, we're proposing here, and that's what he's criticizing, he's saying that uh, light is reflected off the needle in every direction. But as soon as you get there to the North Pole or the South Pole, right, as you see at the bottom, uh, he says, well, at that point, the rays go straight to the screen. So far, so good. We have no problem there so far, okay? You can say that it doesn't even touch the needle. It just goes straight, okay? So it uh, can't even produce a shadow unless it hits the needle, okay? But if it hits the needle, there's no reason for it to go straight, okay? So it either hits it the, the last atom there in the North Pole, uh, and bounces somewhere, or, you know, it goes right through it, in which case he's got to explain why it goes right through that atom. Okay, so he's got to explain that, that detail to us. But he says, but due to the surface being curved, what we observe is that the rays, and notice that he talks about rays. There's no such thing as a ray, but he's going to talk about ray because it's a convenient word. People understand by the word ray a physical object. They think light is a physical object, then they treat it as an abstract concept, as a flow of particles, which is not a ray. So, uh, you know, we have to be careful about the word ray there. It says uh, that the rays reflect in many different angles according to what? The law of reflection. Okay, I don't know what law. He, he Maybe he's a lawyer, or maybe he went to a monastery to study. We have no laws in physics. Okay, laws are in the religion of mathematical physics, not in physics. In science, we don't have laws. In science, we have to explain a mechanism. So there are no laws. The laws means they shoved it down your throat. You must follow it. You must obey it. Means you had to memorize it and, you know, repeat it for your, to get your grade. He says, each reflected ray, right? Again, talking about ray, is making a new dot on the screen. Well, yeah, but yeah, again, either either you hit the North Pole or you don't, that atom there. 
If you hit it, it's going to bounce. It's not going to go to the screen. If it goes right through because it didn't hit it, then uh, you don't get a shadow. You don't. You just get the light directly. Okay. And uh, but the issue here is going to be that blue light, the blue arrows, and we're going to see that in a second here. Let me show you this. This is the issue here. He said, "Oh, first, uh, let me define ray just in case because." Uh, this guy uses the word ray, but hasn't defined it, so I'll define it for him. He can always contradict me and define it differently. It says, any of the lines of light that radiate from a bright object, a beam of radiant energy, such as light, a stream of material particles traveling in the same line, and a single particle of such a stream. And so the problem is we don't know what a ray is. It could be any of the above. And essentially, I think what this fellow is saying is that a ray is a, um, a series of particles that are traveling in straight lines, which is impossible if everything in the universe moves. So uh, we don't have such a straight line in reality. You know, the fact that these people are uh, fooled into believing that a string of particles, discrete particles, uh, meaning that they're not touching each other, right? It's just one right after another, like a bunch of balls. They cannot travel ever. It's impossible to travel in a straight line, what they call straight line, meaning rectilinearly. Okay, that's the correct word. They cannot travel rectilinearly. One will be here, the other one next there, and you'll see what you'll see over time is a curve. That's what it's describing in, in space, right? In, as we move around. And they don't understand that. They say, oh, but the beam went straight. Yeah, then it can't be made of particles, because if it was made of particles, you would have a curve, no matter what. Okay, you cannot conceptualize a straight itinerary, as it's you know, rectilinear itinerary, with discrete particles, not in real life. The earth moves, the earth spins, the sun moves, every atom moves. Can't get, you can't achieve it. Conceptually, it's impossible. Okay, and so here he finishes up saying, at zero degrees, this is the part I like the most, the, most of the light is pointing straight and making the central maxima. No, absolutely not, okay, because he, he's thinking that this thing, this needle is transparent or something, or translucent. No, no, the needle's going to block the light, so you're not going to get the central maxima, which is that uh, heavy light that you get during the slit experiment, right in the center. You're not going to get it because the needle's blocking all the particles there that you see between the north and south pole. So that's not true at all, what he said there. But then he continues with the word rays, and he says, some rays are also deflected or diffracted inwards, contributing to the central maxima. Absolutely not. He's saying that there are particles that turn the corner where you see the red arrows there. How does he explain that? How did they turn the corner? That's the whole issue. The issue is that you cannot explain those red lines with particles. And then he just summarizes as deflections, explain heading of light around corners. Absolutely not. So, you know, this guy hasn't explained anything. First of all, he's describing, he doesn't understand the difference between an explanation and a description. That's the first part. And then he's absolutely wrong. He's, he's got, he's, he, I don't know where he got this. You know, I want him to do this in a lab. Show me with a bunch of balls, right, particles. He can throw sand if he wants with a sand blaster or whatever. And he can go in there and show me how they turn the corner and move inwards, like you see there, okay? So, so no, this doesn't happen. The red lines, uh, the red arrows there, that's what he's explaining. He's describing, really, he's not explaining anything. He's not telling us why they turn the corner. And he just says, well, that's the law of reflection, <laughs> or refraction, or diffraction, or who knows what law he learned out there. No, this is absolute poppycock, what he's pointing out there. None of it holds, uh, even in a lab ex uh, experiment. Yeah, everybody can do it. Just put a telephone pole and show me how the balls go inwards. To show it. Proof. Evidence. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's, that's the whole problem there. Okay, but what, what's interesting about this whole thing is that um, the word mass has not appeared yet. So, so they're explaining the bending of light from a light source, for example, a laser, turning around the corners of a needle, and they're doing it without mass. They're not saying that the mass of the needle is bending light. 
They don't use mass at all here. You know, mass is not part of quantum mechanics. They don't use the word mass at all there. They use the word energy, yeah, another form of mass, supposedly. They use charge, you know, plus, minus, all this nonsense. Field, but they don't use, a oh, force, right? Uh, but they don't use mass, and they don't really do much on time either. They don't use the word time. Mass and time belong to general relativity, okay? So when they're out there, you know, with the satellites and the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, celestial objects, then they talk about mass, and they forget completely about the slit experiment, which also supposedly bends light, you know, if we're talking about photons, discrete photons, you know, bends really, what did we say the other day? It deflects, because you can't say you bend light if light is made of photons, of discrete particles. No, the best you can do is say that it deflects the series of uh, photon. But see, they talk about bending rays, bending light. That's when they put the word ray and the word light, because they're going to bend light, you know. And so we have a little problem there, because if uh, the, this ray, this light is made of photons, then bend, warp, you know, those are the wrong curved, those are the wrong words, wrong verbs, but, or, or adjectives, if you're going to qualify it. No, what we're talking about is deflection. You're deflecting a beam, okay, or a bunch of photons, a series of photons. Then you can say, all these little balls are being deflected. Then we understand, but you can't say bent. But they use the, bend, the word bend because they're going to talk about rays, light, and other elongated objects, which they treat as objects. Concepts which they treat as objects. Okay, so here's uh, just so that you see what I'm talking about, um, that I didn't invent all this stuff. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, mathematical physics does absolutely state that uh, mass bends light. Okay, this, I, didn't, I did not invent this stuff. Okay, so it says, how does gravity affect photons? That is, bend light, right, if photons have no mass. So it's a question of mass bending light, okay? And this comes from astronomy, so it's, uh, you can take this to the bank, okay? They're saying, well, it is true that photons have no mass. It is also true that we see light bend around sources with high mass due to gravity. Yeah, we see light bending, as we saw just now, around needles, and hopefully it's not due to the mass or gravity. <laughs> okay, so we have the same situation, except instead of having the sun and the earth and the far away, you know, the distant star there, what we have is a needle. We have the source of the light, which could be a laser. And we on the screen, what, what we see is fringes. So we bent light, so to speak. And we did it without any mass. Here they're going to do it with mass. So this is not because the mass pulls on the photons directly, but instead because the mass warps the space-time uh, uh, through which the photons travel. So what they're saying is, you know, we're going to weigh uh, uh, the canvas of space-time downwards. This is going to be the explanation. This is going to be the physical interpretation. We're going to bend it down. How? We're going to put the sun there. We're going to weigh it down with the sun. The sun weighs this canvas downwards. So now the, the path, meaning the route, you know, the highway, right? Uh, the road, the real physical road is bent. It's warped. And so the photon has no choice but to roll around or slide around this curved uh, surface. Okay, so what's curved is the surface. Light is not curved or bent. Light is deflected because it's made out of discrete photons, which are rolling or sliding around a curved surface. So we have to understand the context, but these people keep mixing all this up, talking about rays, talking about paths, right? And there they clarified, imagine a bowling ball on a mattress. The ball is a massive object, say the sun, right? And the mass and the mattress represents space-time, okay? So they're talking about physical objects. Either, even though space-time is just a, what, four number lines, which they call coordinates or dimensions. Now, it's neither. It's just a bunch of number lines, four number lines, in which it sits. Of course, space-time is four-dimensional. Absolutely not. It's four... For uh, number line, that's what it is. But it's a bit harder to imagine that. Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. You can't imagine 
four uh, number lines, first being at 90 degrees to each other because number lines have no direction. You cannot put directions to numbers. You know, they always put this arrow in the coordinate system uh, where the arrow points in a given direction is at 90 degrees to another. That's not true in number lines. Number lines, they have no direction and they are not, they don't run perpendicular to anything. You can put numbers in any direction you want. Okay, you can put them in uh, S form if you want. Okay, so that's not true and that's why he's got problems illustrating that or visualizing or imagining it, right? When you place the bowling ball on the mattress, it deforms the surface. Okay, and we understand that. If a grid were drawn on the mattress, you would see the grid deform so the straight lines of the, bo uh, of the boxes were no longer straight. Okay, no problem. We understand that. The same is true for a star sitting in space-time. The star deforms space-time around it, causing it to curve towards the star. Meaning that not only space-time is a physical object according to this description, but it is malleable. Okay, it's stretchy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like rubber bands, you know, and uh, warps at your leisure. Now imagine a marble. This represents a photon. You roll the marble in a straight line on the mattress and it comes too close to the bowling ball. The marble will curve because the mattress it's traveling on dips and curves around the bowling ball. This is what happens to light traveling through space. It dips. I guess all these... You see, they talk about light when they should be traveling, uh, talking about photons, but see, at that point, they talk about rays and light and paths, okay? Traveling through space. When it comes too close to a massive object, it encounters large space-time and curves, not because it's being pulled by gravity. See, it says it curves instead of saying it's deflected, right? But because the space-time it's traveling through is curved. Yeah, the space-time might be curved in your language, but uh, you can't say the light is curved. Light is being deflected because space-time is curved. That's the way it should be said, stated, right? So a straight path becomes a curved, bent one. No, it's uh, the path now they're talking about again. Path, they're saying it's uh, not the itinerary. They're saying the road, the highway. Okay? And that's where the problem is. They, they, a mathematician is a person who doesn't know how to talk. So they use adjectives when they should be using adverbs, and they use... Nouns when they're talking about verbs. That's the problem. Okay, their language. Okay, so where do we go from here? Uh, just to mention, I uh, just wanted to mention this, that not only mass produces bent light, okay? They also bend and warp and curve light with acceleration, okay? This is another one, okay? And this came out of Einstein's head. It had to be out of his head, you know, this great scientist, right, physicist. And he said, if you have zero motion inside an elevator and you point a flashlight, you know, from the outside, the light goes right straight through. Okay, we understand that. If it's in a constant velocity, the two fellows moving at the same time, you have this light uh, going across. Well, again, it looks like we have a straight line, okay? But if you have acceleration, the light bends. <laughs> Why? It should, I guess, uh, in uh, mathematical physics, because it's made out of photons, right? So be careful when you accelerate. You always keep a constant velocity, for otherwise you're bending light. All these photons, they uh, make a curve through space, okay? And yeah, so they have contradictions, because on the one hand, here you have acceleration producing the curvature of light, meaning the deflection of light. Okay, but not when you have a constant speed. Uh, their words, okay, just in case. Yeah, um, incredible, but this is what these people who study 10 years at the university tell you, okay? PhDs, or what was it, DHPs, right? Doghouse parrots, that's what they are. They just parrot what they were taught at the doghouse. So they're not PhDs, they're DHPs. Okay, so what they're saying essentially is the following. Uh, because of it, because, see, because of uh, uh, what these folks discovered, that uh, light bends and so on, uh, and then there's this warpage of space-time, they abandoned Newton. And they abandoned Newton only because of a question of accuracy. Einstein's equation gives better numbers closer numbers to reality than Newton, so they abandoned all, Newton altogether. And partly because Newton could not explain the mechanism, the cause. He said, 
it's all made of particles. How does the sun attract the earth, you know, gravity? With particles. You throw particles out, how do you attract something by throwing stones at it? You know, what you need is a rubber band, you need a, I don't know, a, a wire, some elongated object, then you can pull, then you can explain gravity. But if you're throwing stones, you cannot explain how you attracted the donkey. You need to put a rope around the donkey's head, then you can attract them. That was the problem. And so here's Newton, you know, um, this was, comes from the Cosmic Times, uh, which was published uh, in 1919. And uh, this is out of NASA's uh, website, okay, and says the first, the following says that Newton in optics, he said the, say, said the following, or meant the following, a ray of light from a distant star just grazing across the edge of a massive object should be bent, okay, ray being bent, okay, that's what they're using, the words, by an amount that depends on the object's mass, and thus its gravitational field. Field, what is field? Concept. So we have concept bending things. Newton thought of gravity as a force that pulls things towards an object. The bigger the object, the stronger the pull. And then what was the issue? The issue was a question of accuracy. In the case of Newton, he applied his equation, mass, mass, distance squared, right? A light ray from a distant star grazing the edge of the sun would, should be attracted or bent by the sun's gravity by an amount equal to 0 0.87 seconds of arc. Okay, these are... Uh, astronomical measurements, okay, we don't need to know exactly what they mean, at least not today, we're not going to spend time on uh, determining what they are, but uh, when uh, Einstein came around, he came up with a different notion of what uh, it's, uh, gravity is supposed to be, and he came he, in the same cosmic times there, and they said, according to Einstein, gravity, like, in, like inertia, doesn't pull. Instead, a mass warps or curves space and time surrounding the object. Okay, what we just saw, the sun weighing down space-time. The amount of curvature is proportional to the amount of mass. The curvature of space then curves the paths. Path? Uh, what are we talking about here? Path? Uh, is that a road? Is that an itinerary, a trajectory? What are we talking about? The paths taken by rays. What's a ray? Uh, this stick? Is it a stick? Uh, rays of light. So we have the paths and the rays, okay? And that's what these people talk about. They talk about, you know, <laughs> bending rays, bending the paths of rays. And it says, Dr. Einstein's theory, which is highly mathematical, yeah, in other words, has nothing to do with physics. Physics, we do not use math. Physics is about explaining mechanisms, not about doing equations. Predicts that the curvature of space around the sun should bend Starlight by twice as much as Newton's theory predicts, and here's 1.75 seconds per, of arc. The other guy was 0.087, right? Thus, Dr. Einstein predicts that a ray of light from a distant star grazing the edge of the sun on its way to the Earth would suffer twice the deflections predicted by Newtonian principles. So because he was more accurate, right, here it says the amount of by which uh, starlight deflected is deflected by the sun is thus regarded by astronomers and physicists, mathematical physicists, all of them really, not one of them is a physicist or astronomer, as one of the crucial tests in determining the validity of the uh, Dr. Einstein theory of relativity versus Newtonian physics. In other words, the, the fight between Einstein and Newton was an issue of um, accuracy, okay? So uh, these folks <clears throat> essentially abandoned Newton, which said particles. You know, gravity is particles, yeah, but he couldn't explain it. In fact, he says, finger non hypothesis. He had no clue. <laughs> That's what he was saying. I have no clue. Okay, and here he yeah, is. This is a Newtonian version, okay? He said the sun, you know, sends particles or receives particles from the earth, and that's why the earth doesn't fly away. And he could not explain with particles. He wrote to um, uh, Bishop Bentley, and he said, I have no idea how gravity works, what the mechanism is. And he said that. Uh, but uh, a few hundred years later came Einstein, and he says, I got a different idea. Here it is. This is what I say, I propose. We have this uh, canvas, you know, length, width, and height. We put the earth in there, or the sun, you can put whichever, and the moon just rolls around forever. <laughs> so uh, they changed one, you know, the force for the bending of space-time, which is a geometric theory, okay? So one is a force theory, which Einstein says it ain't, 
but it is anyways because you have a force weighing down the uh, canvas. Why does the earth, or the sun for that matter, weigh down the canvas if it's not a force pushing it downwards? And what is downwards out there in space? Well, we don't know. We haven't figured out. We haven't, you know, settled that issue either. So you have the earth or the sun weighing the canvas downwards with a force, and then for some reason then we have gravity, which is just a geometry of space-time. That's essentially what these people are saying. So we still have force. We haven't gotten rid of force. That's the point, okay? Okay, so... Um, just in case, we rub it in one more time. Here's from Fermilab. Now, Fermilab is, uh, you know, one of these uh, accelerator outfits out there near Chicago. Okay? And here it is. Uh, can you bend light? That's what they say. So here we have uh, confirmation. We have out in space, light rays bend. What's a ray? Well, there you have ray. Ray Charles, I guess. I don't know. Uh, uh, when passing very near massive objects such as stars and galaxies, okay, the presence of matter curves space and the path, the path of light ray. I guess the yellow brick road there, you know, I don't know what path is. Path is an itinerary, a trajectory, or a road. Is it a highway? What is a path? A uh, path of a light ray. So they're talking about the itinerary of a bunch of uh, light rays. What are, what are rays made out of? Particles discrete particles, discrete photons. So we have the itinerary of photons, they call it a path of a light ray, it says we'll be deflected. Finally, someone that uses the right word, deflected as a result. Yeah, they're deflected if you're gonna talk about particles. This process is called gravitational lensing, which we covered last week, because of its uh, similarity to the way normal lenses bend light rays. Again, go back to bend and rays, right? That pass through them. Einstein predicted prediction. All these astrologers predict. They call themselves scientists. Einstein predicted that light rays would be bent by the gravity of massive objects. Okay, and there you see the peaks on the bottom. Okay, Scientists observed this effect soon after the theory of general relativity was published. Uh, Einstein published in 1915 and it was uh, Arthur Eddington that confirmed in 1919, right? A couple years later. Since lenses bend light, they bend light, okay, since lenses bend light, we call any massive object that bends light rays a gravitational lens. By measuring the bending, scientists can determine the mass of the object causing the bending. Now, this is interesting because that's how they determine black holes and dark matter, because they use mass and they say, oh, something is pulling, you know, on something else. You know, why, why is a black hole so popular? Because you have the mass of the black hole, supposedly. You know, this thing that is infinitely heavy, right? And it's tugging on a star that is far away and forcing it to orbit around it. Or it gobbles up its gaseous skin and it eats it up. Okay, by what mechanism? And they say mass. Uh, mass is a concept. Math, uh, concepts don't have the ability to affect things. And so we have this massive uh, black hole, which is a zero-dimensional, no size, no shape, nothing. It's got lots of mass, even though it crushed all matter out of existence, and mass is the quantity of matter or a measure of quantity of matter. It's got no matter, no size, but it's got influence. <laughs> Sounds like a politician. <laughs> And so it's uh, tugging on a star far away, okay? And dark matter, the same thing. You know, why do stars at the edge of a galaxy travel just as fast or faster than the ones on the inside? You know, Pluto, it's like if Pluto traveled faster than Mercury around the sun. And that ain't the case, you know. Mercury is closer by, goes around very fast, 88 days is one orbit. And the other guy takes, what, 248 years. So it's a little bit different, you know, and uh, out there in the galaxy, it's the other way around. The ones on the outside travel faster than the ones on the inside. And so what did they have to do? They said, well, it can only be mass and gravity, right? So they had to pour a lot of mass on the outside of the galaxy to produce that effect. Invisible mass, invisible matter, and they call it dark matter. It's dark because you can't see it, you can't feel it. You know, you, it's translucent because you can see the galaxies in the background where the dark matter is supposed to be, 
So they sprinkle all this dark matter around the edges of the galaxy to get the equations right. So they invented this ghost called dark matter, and that's how they explain all this stuff, if you can call it an explanation. Okay, what's the problem with all this? Let's, let's get rid of it all completely. All this garbage coming out of mathematical physics, out of Cambridge and Harvard and Stanford and MIT and all the Ivy League. Get rid of all of them. Execute them all, I say. I think they should all be hanged, okay, because they're committing a crime against humanity, these people, when they give all this stuff to the public and they say, oh, we can explain all this because we're just telling you what the mathematics says. Absolutely not. They have a completely misconception of how the universe works. And I mean, let's, let's expose these people, okay? Here we go. We're going to go with something called the Cavendish torsion balance, okay? Cavendish came up uh, with this. Actually, it was uh, someone else, but he stole the trick, okay? And so Cavendish um, did this experiment with the torsion balance. It looks more or less like this. This is a modern version. And you might say, well, I don't believe in what I see here, Bill. Uh, you can do it at home. Uh, millions of people have done this already, thousands maybe. Uh, lots of people have done this, okay? So all you need to do is come up to speed on it, okay? But here it is. More or less in slow motion, but it's uh, speeded up because what happened over a period of several minutes is speeded up, okay? But you'll see what the torsion balance does. It pulls masses together here on Earth. We can do it here in the living room, okay? Here it goes. Okay, so what you see here, you see there's a uh, string, a little thread holding up this uh, torsion balance, you could call it, the, the balance there. It's got some weights. And you have two uh, bowling balls, heavy uh, things uh, on opposite sides. And you can see one is attracting one side, the other one's attracting the other side. Okay, and so there you have it in fast motion. Okay, it's a very slow process. Okay, this guy filmed it. Okay, not mine again, just borrowing it. And other people have done the same experiment. Okay. So this is known as the torsion balance, Cavendish's torsion balance, if we want to give it to someone. Okay, you can see mass attracts mass. Now, how much does a bowling ball weigh? Okay, uh, I don't know, a couple pounds. What if you put uh, something that weighs, you know, like a hundred tons? Okay, that's keep that in mind for a second. Okay, we're gonna do something like that right now. Okay, so let's take this one out. Let's put this other one. Okay, the other issue is ray reversibility. What is ray reversibility? A lot of people are not aware. Okay. And again, that's why light cannot be made of particles, cannot be mediated by particles, discrete particles, okay? Because of ray reversibility. It's impossible, simply. You shine a light, any light, you know, against the wall or through a prism or whatever, and light retraces its exact path. Light is two-way, not one-way. Let me repeat that. You send a beam... Right? You know, send some light or whatever, if you wanted to talk about sending, okay? It goes to the prism, it curves or it bends, you could say, right? Light bends, you can see it bending like a spoon when you put it in water, right? So it bends, okay? But the point here is that light retraces its exact path. Okay? And not that it goes this way and then comes through another road to the same point. No, it retraces its exact point its exact path, okay? Trajectory, itinerary is the same, okay? It's called ray reversibility, a uh, very little known uh, uh, phenomenon in uh, optics, okay? Nobody uses it, but here it is. I'm gonna illustrate it here. Light retraces its exact path, okay? It goes to the mirror, right through the prism, and to the light. It goes in both directions, okay? Um, I'm not going to go into the details of how we know this, but if you move, because, you know, Earth moves around the sun, uh, spins, atoms are moving all around, you know. And so if this is made out of particles and the Earth is moving, like we show there, it's, it's made out of particles, and everything is moving, then the light would not retrace its, its path. It's itinerary. It would go somewhere else, okay? That's what we're showing there. Okay, and this is something that shows that you can, the ray reversibility shows that you cannot use particles to simulate um, light. And, the, and then you have the, uh, uh, 
the torsion balance, okay? Why am I bringing these two phenomena, well-known phenomena, well-established phenomena up? Because of the following. We're going to take a light laser. Is that fine with you? We'll take a laser pointer, right? And we point it at a mirror or a, some, some object, okay? And so we mark it. We say, okay, it's always pointing at that when it's straight. And now we're going to bring over several tons of weights, of matter, whatever you want. Will it bend the beam? Or will the beam continue straight, you know, into this thing that you marked there? So let me illustrate that. And it's got, it's got to do with ray reversibility and also with the torsion balance. Okay, here it is. Okay, here's a, so by the way, that's Fermat's uh, principal least um, uh, path, okay? But here's the point. You, you've got uh, one kilometer. You go to the desert, right? You shine a laser to a mirror, okay? And you mark a spot on the mirror. You can even uh, uh, connect the mirror to the flashlight so that you always have the same distance, the same everything, okay? And now you bring in three ton 300 tons there. You put them, you line them up along the beam next to it. Will the beam bend as predicted by mathematical physics? Okay, because according to them, you put all these tons there, well, it's going to warp space somewhat, and that amount of warpage is going to, you know, twist or bend the, the beam of light. Does this happen? Well, I'll bet you a billion dollars it doesn't happen. Okay, you can put all the ton, you can put a mountain next to it. Okay, you can do this experiment in the desert and compare it to a, next to a mountain, you should get the same results. Always a straight line. Okay, uh, because again, it's not made out of particles, a beam is not made out of particles, it's made out of a rope. Okay, well, the mediator of light is a rope, and that rope is taut, it's pulled straight. And here, more or less, uh, if you can see this, hopefully. Uh, put it closer there, okay, it's, uh, there it is, okay, and my fists, you know, they're the atoms, okay, here it is, ah, there we go, there we go, okay, so my fists are the atom, and there you have this rope, okay, can connect some, torsion of this thing is light, and at the same time, you have a mediator for gravity, which is a force of pull, uh, no space-time, no waves, no particles, a rope. With that, I'll see you next week.